We're starting our last, our last session of the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. You know, I think sometimes we might even look at this last uh, verse, verse 13 here in Matthew 6, and, and we might just read over it real quick, you know, or just kind of say the ending. And this is, I'm going to read it right now. It's the white bottom one on the right. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And this is the King James version up here that we're reading from. But I think a lot of times we'll read, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, glory, blah, 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 forever. Amen. Yeah! Right? Sometimes we just kind of scroll through the ending, just like any Listen, when I'm reading a book, sometimes I'm looking, I'm reading, I'm going through it. I'm almost done with the page. Maybe no one can relate to this, but you're like, I've almost completed 10 pages today. That's a good thing for me. So I'm like, I'm almost done. Let me just finish that. Oh my God. Ah, I'm done with it. But right here, Jesus is saying something that is so pivotal for our walk, so vital for us as Christians, what we believe and in who he is. But before I do that, I do just want to throw in a little theological insert here. Some of you might be out there and you're like, why doesn't that last part where it says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, why isn't that in my Bible right now? Maybe you have an NIV or an ESV. It's a new international version, English standard version, different translation. And you're saying, hmm, wait, this is odd and strange. Now, I'm not going to go into a whole biblical archaeology class right now. Not at all. One, it's an area that I do love and enjoy, but honestly, if you ever really want a good course, maybe we'll get Pastor Zarlino to come do another coffee and theology. Who was there last time we did coffee and theology? We did, yeah, a whole thing on the Bible. It's authenticity, inerrancy, and fallibility. Awesome. But here, I'm going to give it to you real quick. For those of you who are out there who say, it's not in my Bible, wait a second, or those of you who are like, hmm, sparked an interest. All right, here it is. There's two main texts that we can bring it back to that we've taken our translations from, ancient text, and that is from the Byzantine and the Alexandrian. And so without going into a ton of detail there, when you look at the Byzantine text, it's called the majority text. And, and I, I, part of me right now, my, my church history side just wants to start going into this. But I, I really, what I want to say here is this, is that it is a part of the scriptures, and it doesn't mean that, oh no, the scripture is no longer authentic. Or, oh no, if it says it here but not there, there's an in- inerrancy here or an infallibility. No, not at all. It's just that from those two texts, there's a small little percentage of little things that are added in one and not in the other. And some scholars have debates upon it. That's why you might hear someone say, King James only. If it ain't King James, it ain't Bible. You know, that's what they say a lot in the South. Is Pastor Scott still here? He was in the back before. He's from Texas. That's what he says every... No, he doesn't say that. Um, but... But other people say, well, the Alexandrian text is a different one. So I'm not going to go into tons of detail on that, but here's what I'm saying. That ending is called a doxology part, and it is in the majority text there. All right? Cool. Okay, great. That's all I need. I just need some affirmation. You heard it. So the whole time I'm like, guys, if you have more questions, please come talk to me about it. Let's have a conversation, and we can jump through it. But the Bible is the real deal. It's authentic. You study the Word of God, and you compare it to any other ancient text, you will see how it is such, it, it is supernatural, the authenticity of Scripture compared to the historical accuracy, to the authorship, to all the manuscripts that line up with each other verbatim. It's amazing. All right, there it is. That's my little thing. Okay, so... We read those last words here in the Our Father. And sometimes it's the cliche thing. Oh, we're talking about temptation and evil. Wah, wah, wah. We always talk about that stuff. And then we say amen at the end and we're all happy and now we leave. Listen, this ending part is letting us know something. It's letting us know that there is a battle taking place around us. A battle that we are in every day. Because here's the truth. As Christians, we're trying to live by the virtues of God, but we're in a world that in no way supports the values of God and who he is. So there's going to be a constant, constant battle there that's taking place. Now, when we look at that, I want to break it down 
Because when we, we, we look first and lead us not into temptation, that word temptation, and some of us might say, well, I don't know what that is. And that's perfectly okay. And others of you say, well, I know what that is. Or maybe someone else is like, I'm going to Google it right now. I love Google. I'm not saying everything on Google is right, but it's a great thing to just spark. If you have a question about something, you type it in there, it can get you looking at different sources and all that. It's not Wikipedia. Any professors out there, teachers, you're like, Wikipedia. My kids are cutting and pasting everything off of Wikipedia. Maybe you are and you're feeling guilty. Okay. The definition of temptation, if you just looked it up in a dictionary, a desire to do something wrong or unwise. When we look at the biblical definition, though, it goes a little deeper than that. And I always like doing that when we're, when we're breaking down scripture is let's look at one definition and let's look at another one. Let's understand the terms we're dealing with, the layers in which comes with those words. A trial or affliction, anything that tests our virtue. Temptation. You know, many times I think we have misconceptions, though, of this statement here. Here's one of them. We read this, and lead us not into temptation. Wait a second, Pastor Stephen. Are you saying that God is sadistic and sly? That he wants to lead me in to a temptation? And we might say, Wait a second, so here's an example. You're doing a diet, just vegetables and fruit, and you see God there, and he's got this giant, for me it would be pizza. We talked about this last week, big ziti pizza. He's like, hi, eat this pizza, okay? And we might think, is this what this is saying here to me? That God's constantly trying to lure me, or he's got poison in one sense, and he's covered it up with chocolate. It's like, hmm, hey, eat this. And we do, we laugh at that, but sometimes that's our misconception of even this statement here, or sometimes even God. And it separates us totally from from his heart. Actually, that whole thinking there goes against the Lord's prayer. Look up there in the bowl. Our Father, we talked about that relationship of intimacy and love of a father. So that's a total misconception. He's not a sadistic and sly God that would defeat everything that Jesus is sharing with us here when he kicks it off and says, our Father, and shares of the love of God. But I cannot deny that there are moments throughout Scripture that we see God allows his people to go through trials, tribulations, and times of testing. Great example of that is in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Jesus goes into the wilderness. He's tempted by Satan himself. He doesn't fall into temptation, but he is tempted. See, we can't get away from trials and tribulations and things that we would even term as temptations around us. Because like I said before, we're in the midst of a world that is going against the values of our God. But encountering a temptation and falling into it are two different things. There are two different things. And, and this is what I want to say. When Jesus is saying this here, I think we could break it down to two main points we're understanding. Remember, he's teaching us as Christians, this is how you should pray. This is how you should approach Almighty God, your Father. And when it says, lead us not into temptation, what it's saying to me here is that there's not some sort of heroic faith that's happening. Like that attitude of, anything I encounter, I can take care of. <laughs> That was my heroic statement. (laughs) That was pretty epic. Just on the spot, man. Epic. Okay, good. He has a Captain America shirt on. I wanted Jeremy to stand up every time I said the word epic tonight. That was our first time. Keep an eye on that. So this idea of a heroic faith, almost in one sense a pride, that I can take on any temptation that comes my way. And sometimes we have that in our Christianity and in in our lifestyle. We start to think too highly of ourselves when really we have to find our strength as we're going to go further into this really in, in Christ. But this heroic faith, instead, what it's really emphasizing to you and to me is that there's a humility here in a desperation for the divine care of our Father God. A cry, Lord, lead us not into temptation. I need you. Help me not to fall into those temptations, those things that are around me, the evil that surround me. I don't want to fall vice to them. Now, how do I combat this then? How do I combat this constant battle that we are in, in this world? 
between the things of our flesh and our spirit. And what that's saying is our flesh, the things of our natural desires that want to pull us away from God and who he is. And that our spirit, though, who wants to go into the presence of God and be engaged and touched by him. How do I do this and combat it? We actually said it already. And lead us. And lead us. We already answered our question before we even got to it because this is, this is what we're saying here. Who's leading us? In John 10, 14, Jesus says he's the good shepherd. Constantly throughout scripture, we see this picture of us as those who follow Jesus as his sheep. And Jesus is our shepherd. You know, what does a shepherd do? He leads his flock. But many times, maybe you've seen an example of a shepherd who's carrying a sheep or pulling it off of a cliff or, or maybe it's stuck in a thorn bush, whatever it is. But many times the sheep wander away. They haven't followed the leading of the shepherd. And when they do that, what are they out of now? They're out of the presence, literally, of the shepherd and his protection. And so when we look at that, it kind of takes a whole new level because even the word lead, when you break it down in the original language, literally can mean to carry. To carry. And that's why when you see a picture all of a sudden now of a shepherd who's carrying his sheep, you know that that sheep is so safe. It's in the presence of that shepherd. No matter what the trial was, the temptation around it, the presence of the shepherd is more prevalent. It's there stronger. So see, the question for you and I in this is, who is leading us? Because it comes down to us following the lead of Jesus Christ, our good shepherd, and it takes you and me to be utterly dependent upon him. That strikes in my heart. Because I think about this. If I can't get away from temptation if it's always gonna be around me, the things that are trying to lure me away from the presence of God, Lord, how am I delivered? It's when I realize and I put myself in a place where the presence of Jesus Christ is so strong in my life and he's always in front of me, leading me, that he's more real than the temptation that surrounds me. And if we can become a people who see that, we're not negating the battle of our flesh. We're not negating the things around us fighting for our attention. But what we're realizing is our God is truly greater. His love is deeper. And he's more real than even the things that try to lure us away. I'm going to invite the band to uh, start heading back up here. Because we're going to have another chance to really just worship the Lord and be in his presence. But there is that other part but deliver us from evil. Listen, there's evil in this world. You know, we know there's good, we know there's evil, and I'm not talking here about the yin and the yang, okay? This idea that there's a perfect balance that comes into place where both are equal and it, and it creates this just beautiful opposing forces that brings a balance in the universe. No, because in no way when I see evil and I see the power of God, are they equal? Even to use the analogy of an, of an ant and a human being wouldn't do it justice because our God is omnipotent, omniscient. He's so powerful. He's beyond that all. But there is a reality of evil. And actually here, when you break down that word, it normally is meaning the evil one. The evil one. And, and, and I... I think so often we want to take the whole conversation, the word devil, out of there. But the devil is real. He's real. He wants to destroy you. He wants to steal everything you've had in your life. He wants to kill you, destroy you. That's his goal. That's his desire. So there's a real enemy there, evil, who wants to bring you down. Wickedness that wants to take your life and mess it all up. But the question for us is who will we follow? Truth, who will you follow? James 4.4 4 says this, you adulterous people, 
Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Matthew 12, 25 Jesus knew their thoughts, the Pharisees, and he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. You have to make a choice. Who are you gonna follow? Are you gonna follow Jesus or are you gonna follow the world? The world where evil is waiting, where the devil is waiting, where temptations are lurking. Who are you gonna follow? And you can't do both. You cannot be in the kingdom of God and a part of it if you're trying to play both kingdoms. Because like Jesus said there in Matthew, it's going to crumble. You have to make a choice. But here's the thing. One can truly deliver you from evil. Because in 2 Corinthians 3.17, it says this, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You want to live in freedom from your temptations and trials? You want to live in freedom and victory of the bondage of sin in your life, of the bondage of that thing? Whatever that thing is, it keeps coming your way, whether that's sexual, whether it's relational, whether it's a character, whatever it is inside of you that is constantly pulling you away from the presence of God, luring you out of his leading in your life. If you want freedom from it, you've got to invite the presence of God around you and in you. And it's a constant thing. It's a constant thing. He can break those chains in our lives. I think so often we get so down on ourselves. We keep falling into the same thing every time. And these words just become words. And you know what? If we just keep them as words, nothing will change. But if we see the shepherd in it, that he wants to lead us, that we need his presence every day, every day. Like we were singing before and Matt had shared, the presence of God, we wait for it. If we have that in our lives, I promise you, and I stand here not in pride, but in brokenness and humility, that he can free you from those temptations. He can free you from those things that have held you captive in bondage. But you need him every day. You need his presence. He's the shepherd. Listen, I have a whole funny story. When I was in Oklahoma, there was a church that did a thing called Nightmare. Basically, they set up their whole facility in all these different stages. It was during the Halloween season, and it was all these intense moments of life. And even one of them was actually kind of like a hell thing. It was, it was actually really intense. And they would bring people through, and then at the end, they would share the gospel with them. And, um, and so I just was my freshman year... At college, I'm like, oh, I'll just, I'll just go to check it out. Now, remember, you're kind of in a line, and you go through a door, and you're in this next section. And this section was like a swampy, scary area with dudes who'd shave their heads coming up out of the swamp. And kids, these guys, they'd be like, the whole year, it's like, why do you have your head shaved? Come see me at Nightmare. I'm in hell. I'm like, that doesn't sound right. And that's, <laughs> this is weird. So it was very, I walk in there, and there was this sweet little boy. He had to be about eight years old. Little husky fella right there. He would have beaten me in King of the Hill, no problem. And that was, so he's sitting there, standing there, in the middle of hell, okay, by himself. His group had left. So that kid had been there for like three or four minutes, shaking. And our new group came in, and I saw him, and I just went up and said, what's your name? And I put my arm around him, and he stopped shaking. And I held him there. I said, hey, it's all right. I'm going to be right here with you. And we're going we're gonna to walk through this together. And there was a couple other people. With us. We surrounded him. We held him. And we walked with him through. And I think so often we can get stuck in that shaking place in our life. Like that sheep that's gone astray. And we're so afraid. And we're so scared. Or we feel like a failure. I did it again. Jesus, our shepherd, our savior, comes up around us, wraps his arms around us, leads us, carries us, holds us, 
He brings us through those times, but sometimes he brings us back and he gives us the option. You can stay in my arms or you, you can jump back and go with the other sheep. We can stay by my side. We need to constantly stay by his side. And when we do that, we won't fall back into those dark, dismal places of defeat. So let's stand up together. And I hope at the end of this series, this is what you come to. This prayer is a window into the endless mercy, love, and grace of God. But it's also a map that guides us in our pilgrimage to his heart. That's what Jesus is showing us here. He's taking us to those places. And at the end, in that doxology, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It's a declaration, what? As a community. The prayer begins with our, not my, our Father, the community of us coming together. We're sons and daughters of Almighty God. And it ends with a declaring that He is our King and it is His glory and it is endless and His mercy is endless and His grace is more than sufficient. It's our banner and declaration as a community with one another. So our question is, who will you follow? Who will you follow? Who will you let lead you? And if you think it's a joke and you don't think someone's fighting for your attention, that's a lie. There's two roads. There's two leaders. You have to choose which one. Whose arms will you place your life in? Whose kingdom will you usher in to this lost and dying world? So as we worship now, Let's just get back into the arms of our shepherd. Let's let him carry us and lead us. He loves us. He loves us. He's our father.